and then I'm and then I'm going to turn this over to Monique, please, to introduce our speaker. And she'll have to unmute herself as will Sally when she comes on. Shall I start? Please. Okay. All right, well, you've all read the little book that we had with the invitation. So you all know that uh, uh, Sally Tagliamonte, sorry for the pronunciation, um, has taught at U of T since 2001. She's now chair of the linguistic department at U of T. She's also a member of the Royal Society of Canada and a fellow of the Linguistic Society of America. You also know that she does research in social linguistics, that she has published six books and is the, is the editor of a series published by Cambridge University Press. Okay, so I thought this was impressive enough, but I had not spoken to and so on. I wrote to Sally and asked if she wouldn't mind, you know, sparing a few minutes with me on the phone and she kindly accepted. She told me that I was the first person ever to want to talk to her before introducing her, which I found strange, but I did. And I'm glad I did. Because the first thing I discovered is that Sally is a lovely human being. She's not just a scholar. And then I read her CV, which she sent me. And it, it's 80 pages long. And it doesn't have any blurb, it just lists. So I'll give you a sample, a very short summary. The honors. In 2018, she was considered, and I'm quoting, one of the 39 women doing amazing research in computational social science. Her research grants take three pages. For her publications, she's published 81 articles, one to appear, eight pending, 33 chapters in books, and six to appear, five computer programs, 166 pages at meetings and symposia, 62 invitations to give lectures at conferences and workshops. She's given lectures at 56 lectures at university. And she found time to do what we would call in our field community work. She went out to, to high schools all over Ontario to talk about linguistics, 30 schools in all. Radio interviews, podcasts, you know, I can go on and on. She supervised 20 MA thesis. 12 PhDs, she's external examiners of six PhD dissertations in Europe, and I didn't even count the committees. After reading all this, I really wondered if she has time to sleep, and maybe she doesn't. But I do know that she found the time to raise five kids. So I find this quite amazing. So you can see that we are very honored to have her as a speaker. And like all of you, I'm really looking forward to her talk. Thank you. If you would unmute yourself, Sally, and come on on. So that was lovely, Monique. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm going to share sound and now share my slides. And hopefully you'll, do you see them yet? Oops. Make sure this works. There we go. Hopefully that will come up. There we are. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to share uh, this afternoon with you to tell you about my work in, uh, in Ontario. And this talk is called Soakers, Slimes, and Other Expressions, including Ontario dialects in the Oxford English Dictionary. So I should have just said good day, eh? Because if you go up north in Ontario and you go into Tim Hortons or any restaurant or gas station, people will say good day. And sometimes they might even say good day, eh? I want to begin very practically by playing you a story. And one of the things that is my absolute pleasure to be able to do as a language scientist is to also have certain aspects of my work involve anthropology. And part of that anthropological work is to go to communities and talk to people, talk to strangers 
who tell me stories about their lives. And in this story, I'm going to ask you to wonder where, how, who is this person? There's three, there's three people share sheep in the area. And the fellow says, I'd like to stay in your own area type deal. There's no point in crossing paths to go into somebody else's territory. You keep yours and I'll keep my area around here. Word travels ahead of you. And I was at a place in his territory, another guy's territory. They phoned up one sheep club. So I went up, made the date to go. I said, there's something radically wrong to this guy. What do you mean? Well, there's a sheep shearer in the area. What am I doing here? So the old guy took me down the barn, looked out through a barn window, and he says, see that barn away over there, eh? Yeah, that's where he lives. And that's where he'll stay. <laughs> Just like that. So now I've had that job ever since. Yeah. They must have had a disagreement or something. Yeah. Yeah. The three, the three. So I played it for you without the transcript so that you could really just listen to this fella and how he's telling you the story about something that happened to him in his life. And this is the transcript all of the materials we collect in the field, we transcribe with orthographic transcription. And then it is basically a digital database that we can work with in our analyses. Now, one of the things I want you to think about is having listened to that story, and I'm quite willing to play it again if you would like me to. What do you know about them? Can you tell? Their gender, anybody? Yeah, nodding heads. Yeah, it is a guy, a fella. Can you get an approximate sense of his age? That too, right? Like this is not a teenager and it's not someone who's very elderly. Now, it's gonna get a little trickier. Where do you think this man was born? Anybody got any? Maritimes. So Mary says Maritimes. Good guess. Anybody else where he might come from? Where he might be living even to this day? Ontario. Somewhere what? in Ontario? Any specific location? Lanark County. Lanark County. Oh, somebody's really good. Yeah, how much education do you think he has? High school. Probably high school. Good. And ethnicity. Well, you see what I'm getting at. You can tell a lot about the way someone talks. And in this case, I often can fool people quite a bit, especially my students, because most people, unlike the smart people that you are, have no idea that this person could possibly be from near Perth, Ontario, which you see on the map here. So he's male, he's born in 1960. His level of education is not university. But he is a highly trained sheep shearer with apprentice training. His background is mixed UK roots. His grandfather was born in Scotland, so a bit of Scots. And other members of his parental group were Irish. And he was born in Perth, Ontario. And absolutely right, I can't remember if it was John or Michael, born uh, in Lanark County, Ontario. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. Can you tell where I was born? I was born in Kirkland Lake, Ontario, which is fairly far away from Toronto, about 800 kilometers, maybe a little less. And what I want to 
get you to think about is how much of someone's past history is present in the way they use their vernacular variety of English. As it happens, we had a little discussion about my name. Most people wonder why I pronounce my last name incorrectly, and I've been corrected all my life for my poor pronunciation. And yet, despite my phenotype, which you can observe very clearly, uh, my background is British, at least on my mother's side, and I hold British citizenship. My grandparents, who had the general store in Swords, Ontario, were an incredible learning ground for someone who was eventually going to become a linguist. Because what I overheard at that general store was amazing to my ear. I heard things like stories where people said, I says, and then he says, and then I says, and then he says. And I heard verb forms like he come yesterday. And I heard expressions like it's a good job to mean it's a good thing. And expressions like, oh, it's just down the drag there to mean, oh, it's just down Main Street. And I heard words like shad flies and fly dope and sentence enders like A and sentence enders like C. And of course, <laughs> the funny thing is when I was growing up in Northern Ontario, I used to think that Ontario was the most boring place on the planet because of course I was the fish in the fishbowl as I'll tell you about in a minute. It took me a while after coming back to Toronto uh, uh, from a sojourn in the UK to collect what I refer to as the Ontario Dialects Project. And a lot of people ask me, well, you know, why is that so unusual that you would study Ontario dialects? And I tell them, well, I used to think it was pretty boring to study Ontario dialects. Uh, but something happened one day in an undergraduate class at the University of Toronto. As I, and probably you, typically do in an undergraduate class in a large lecture room is you tell your students stories to help them embed learning. And I was telling my students a story. And I suddenly realized as I looked at the class that they didn't really understand the punchline of the story. As it happens, I had used a word that they did not understand. And we'll come back to what that word was in a minute. But at the moment when I realized they didn't understand the story because they didn't understand the punchline because I had used a word that I thought everybody knew. I realized, wait a second, dawning on me with one of those Eureka experiences, I just used a word from my background that nobody in this room knows. And at that point I realized one of the things I really must do is go up north and see what I can find as an anthropologist, as a linguist, and as an analyst. And so I did. I've been collecting data, stories from people born and raised in communities across Ontario since about 2003. I go to lots of places, mostly small towns like Elmont in Lanark County, which clearly some of you have been to, or Kirkland Lake, Ontario, which is where I was born, or Middleville, or Beaverton. Some of these small towns like Capiscasing in the far north are pulp and paper towns. And some of them like Perry Sound are tourism towns, even though Perry Sound has another claim to fame, which some of you might know about. And I created with the help of the IT department at the University of Toronto, the Ontario Dialects website as a front facing public oriented website where people could tap in to the kinds of words and expressions that are found in Ontario that may not be part of the variety spoken in Toronto or a part of standard English. And the other thing that I have been very fortunate to be able to do is to collect legacy recordings. Everywhere we go, um, and I usually take students except for the past two years, on a field trip in May, 
and I take a small group of students and we go to small towns across Ontario. And at just about every place I go, somewhere in the library, in the archives, in the museum, there's a dusty old box in the basement with cassette tapes where people in the 70s, sometimes even earlier, collected stories from elderly people in the community. So in the Ottawa Valley, I'm very privileged to have the Ian Pringle and uh, Podolsky materials that they collected in the early 80s. I have material from the Tay Valley, from Belleville, from the Cobalt Mining Museum, from Kirkland Lake, and especially from John McPhee's work in Perry Sound. The Ontario Dialects Project, as I call it, is a project of documentation. However, as a linguist, one of the most important things I'm interested in in my research is how languages change. How do systems of grammar move through the currents of time? And how can these materials show us the range of changes that are pro in progress across the 20th century in English as it's spoken in Ontario? We know from sociolinguistics that language changes for any number of reasons, but there are both linguistic internal motivators for linguistic change, as well as external factors that impinge on linguistic change, like the difference between whether you come from an urban center or a rural community, and the relative proximity of those places to, for example, the mega city of Toronto or the GTA. And we know that contrasts across sociolinguistic dimensions are really critical for understanding how language changes. So if you come from a place that has a small population versus a large population, how much language contact has there been in that place? Whether the social networks in the community are dense or whether they're loose. The amount of community shared information and the contrast between high versus low social stability. For example, the boom and bust economy of northern mining towns compared to manufacturing in the south. And underneath it all, as an analyst, as a linguistic scientist, there is grammatical change going on. But instead of focusing on the details of linguistic analysis in, the, in this talk, what I would like to do is bring to you some of the joy I get from studying language by playing a little game with you about the words that are in the Ontario Dialects Project. And this is where I come to the Oxford English Dictionary. I don't know about you, but I think the Oxford English Dictionary is about the most amazing uh, source that we have as people uh, at the University of Toronto. I can just log in and I can find out about words in the history of the English language. Now I'll tell you a little story. Not too long ago, um, before the OED project got going, I happened to be in Japan and the editor of the Oxford English Dictionary was giving the keynote address to kick off the conference. And what he presented were the Japanese words that are found in the Oxford English Dictionary, which made me wonder, wow, if there are Japanese words in the Oxford English Dictionary, how about Canadian words? Are there any Canadian words in the Oxford English Dictionary? Because of course, I'm looking at the Oxford English Dictionary all the time, but I never really thought to say, well, is this word Canadian? Is this word from Ontario? Where's this word from? Is it Canadian? Does anybody want to guess how many words in the millions, I don't know how many words are in the Oxford English Dictionary. It's got to be hundreds of thousands. How many words are labeled Canadian? Anybody want to take a guess? We've got some good guessers in the audience. I know that. <clears throat> Nobody wants to take a guess? Okay, well, I counted 40. There are 260 words in the Oxford English Dictionary that say they're Canadian. Well, 
you know, as someone who's been studying Ontario English for a very long time, I was really disappointed. Only 260 words? I have 11 million words in my archive of the Ontario Dialects Project. And I thought, surely I could contribute to the Oxford English Dictionary by providing them with some new words from Canada. And so I went up to the editor after the talk and I said, hey, how would you like to have some Canadian words in the Oxford English Dictionary? And of course, he was very excited by that prospect. And we embarked upon a, a, a project where I would, I would track down the words, give them to the dictionary, and they would decide which of them could be put into the dictionary. So uh, between myself and my research assistants, uh, we went through all of the words as best we could. Um, and this was just a preliminary step. And we labeled these words for whether they were not in the dictionary. Of course, the ones that were in the Oxford English Dictionary, we just left aside because that's not interesting. The Oxford English Dictionary's lexicologists already had found those words or they're in the English language. Some of them have been in the English language since Beowulf. So we labeled them each for what we called gold, silver, or bronze words. So the gold words were the ones that, ha ha, we found something that is not in the Oxford English Dictionary. There's no entry for this thing. Then there was a whole bunch of words that are in the Oxford English Dictionary. But when you look at their meaning, it's not the same meaning as we find in Ontario. And finally, we labeled the bronze words for words that are in the Oxford English Dictionary and in Ontario. But what the Oxford English Dictionary says is US origin or US South or mostly US or US East something like that. And so that really kind of irked me because I thought, well, why would they say it's US? They haven't even checked Canada. It's probably not US, it's probably North America, but it doesn't say that in the dictionary. So what I'd like to do is play this little game that I hope will be fun and also underlyingly relevant. And that is to take you on a adventure through the, the words in the Canadian archive in my Ontario dialects project. So if you can unmute, if that's possible, Linda and Monique, sure. uh, because I would like to uh, see what you all have to say. So I'm gonna start with a really easy word, which I know will be simple for you. And here it is. We. No. What does it mean? Small. 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 Does it have another meaning? Tiny. Uh, Little. Dear. And then sweet. Nature. Dear at eight. Hey. Can you hear? Uh, it has a more uh, vulgar uh, meaning in some uh, families as well. Which maybe I, I, I am too polite to mention. <laughs> we, we. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I gave this talk or a, a version of this talk to a group of small children uh, not too long ago. I think they were homeschooled children in a small town in Northern Ontario between uh, six and 12. And when I put up this word, the kids got a real kick out of it because you know what they thought it meant. <laughs> but one really smart kid at the back raised his hand. And he said, that's not what it means. And I said, well, what does it mean? And he said, it means this. It's something I play on my ah. video concert. Oh, and I thought, that's a smart kid. Come on to the University of Toronto and study language with me someday. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next word. And this is the word. This was the word. It was like the tip of the iceberg when I told that story in my undergraduate class that fateful day, 
and I told the story okay. about a soaker. So before you start telling me what you think it means, it could mean a soaker system, which is something that you, or maybe I, because we might have back gardens or backyards that we like to grow things in. It could be a soaker system, right? Because that's something that's a soaker. Or any of you have grandchildren, it could be one of those super soaker guns that sprays water all over, right? But that was not the meaning I intended, and it was not the punchline of the story I told the students. Does anybody want to take a guess? Oh, there's one more meaning. There's also a soaker, which is a type of <laughs> diaper, apparently, for children. I didn't know that until I started looking. But again, this was not the meaning I intended when I told my story. Does anybody know what Have a soaker is? step in a puddle and it sure. goes over your boots and your whole foot gets yeah. wet? What boots? Yes, indeed. Feet. Rain. Wet, wet, Torrential rain. Feet. Yeah. Wet feet. For anybody that grew up in a place that has a lot of snow, you know that a soaker is a very common thing that happens in the wintertime. Yeah. Wet feet. Flush. There you go. Soaker. But out of a class of 165 students in Toronto, they had no idea that that was the <laughs> word for wet feet. Interesting. Okay, next word. Next word is gas bar. Anybody heard this one? Mm -hmm. Apparently, this is one of the words that until my additions to the Oxford English Dictionary was actually in the Oxford English Dictionary as mm -hmm. a Canadian word gas bar and there you see the entry in the oxford english dictionary canada petrol station one without a garage for service or repairs and having only basic facilities as pumps and a kiosk hmm. one of the few canadian words in the oxford english dictionary <laughs> interesting didn't ravel write a piano piece called gaspar de la nuit I don't know. I wonder if he was Canadian or whether he had traveled in Northern Ontario. I don't know. But there we have it, a gas bar. And actually, at that uh, country store where my grandfather had his uh, gas station, it was a gas bar. Interesting. <laughs> now, did anybody ever, did it ever occur to you that this word was a Canadian word? Block eater. Oh. Mm. You live in Winnipeg, you would. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, this is one of those culturally embedded words that we have in Canada that other people around the world have no idea about. And of course, you probably all know that it's a type of heater in a car so that you can start your car on mornings where when it's 35 below in the north. <laughs> and block heater, again, is another one of those words that was identified uh, in the OED as being chiefly Canadian, a device for heating the engine block of a motor vehicle. So now I'm going to play you an excerpt from a woman uh, born and raised in Timmins, Ontario, mm -hmm. age 54. Let's hear what she says about block heaters. I, I got a car before too long. And uh, one of the first things went wrong was I was driving, because, you know, it's a car, right? So it's going to go wrong. <laughs> driving, and all of a sudden, these billows of steam everywhere. What? What's going on? I was totally terrified. I had no idea. I pulled off the road, got around the corner, opened the hood, and I actually blew the frost plug out of the bottom of my engine. Really? Took it in. Well, they came in rescued the car and I said well what happened what I mean what what is a frost plug and why did it blow out you know he says well you know this just gonna happen I said well is this the same place that the block heater goes and he said what block heater I said the car doesn't have a block heater I couldn't believe it you you plug in your car every night up here so uh, there's Wilma telling you the story about the block heater, but I hope that also gives you a flavor of how people talk 
uh, in, uh, in this particular community. Okay, here's a famous Canadian word that I'm sure you all know. I, I got a Mickey. Oh, Mickey, yeah. <laughs> Mickey. yeah. Mickey. I don't know what a Mickey is, uh, yeah. but I'm telling you, I've had some interesting conversations with Americans <laughs> about what a Mickey yeah. is. It's, it's at half a 26er. Yes. So again, chiefly Canadian, a small bottle of liquor holding usually uh, 375 milliliters or 13 ounces, half a 26er of <laughs> alcohol. Mm -hmm. And right. here's an example. Oh, okay. yeah, like, um, yeah, my friend one time couldn't get in because she had like a Mickey in her purse. So like they randomly check, so that sucks. Right. <laughs> so, Mickey. so we should all go out and get ourselves a Mickey and, and really appreciate our good Canadian words. <laughs> okay, here's another one now. Maybe you know this one, maybe you don't. Let's see. Uh, How about yeah. to muck? Oh. Mm -hmm. How about to clean out? To clean out. To clean, out the manure, clean out the manure. Yeah. Clean out the manure. Okay, that's what most people say. Does anyone have another meaning for muck? To muck? To mess around? Muck yes, up. you can muck around, definitely. In Australian, it would mean, in Australian, it would mean to um, misbehave a child, mucking up. Mucking up? Good, that's cool. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful word, but in the North, it means to muck out a mine. Uh -huh. And wow. so you, not only do you muck out the mine, you get muck piles, <laughs> right? And you, do, you have a mucking machine and muck is a very important word in Northern mining communities. Uh -huh. So here's to muck. The most dangerous thing I've ever done in the mine. Taking down loose ground in front of us. Like when you drill and blast a round, which could be 16 feet wide, uh, 12 to 14 feet high, and then you go and muck it out. Then there's a loose ground above you. Oh my gosh. And you have to get that down. How? Oh. Well, you muck it and then you rock bolt it. <laughs> you, you muck and you rock bolt and you screen. And you can even shot creek where you uh, spray cement up into the screening. There's all kinds of ways of doing it now. So you can see mucking is not a particularly pleasant task, <laughs> but it's a very common word in the North because there's so much mucking going on. <laughs> the most dangerous thing. So here's another word, maybe you know this word, keener. Oh, yeah. oh, you sit in the front row. Okay. <laughs> exactly. But interestingly, this is not a word with that meaning that appears in the Oxford English Dictionary. It means it's something completely different there. Keener. Sharp. It means a person in Canada, a person who's extremely or excessively eager or zealous, a keener. Mm -hmm. Of course, in Ireland, it has a completely different meaning. So let's hear. You keener. mean like wailing? Yes, wailing at a funeral, indeed. Like I remember getting a, the math award grade eight graduation because I, I ended up coming out with a hundred percent on my I report card and math and stuff like that. So, uh, I what was that Carl? No. Okay. I'll play this again. I really was. I, I was just a keener. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's the keener. She got a hundred percent. She's probably sitting in the front row. Um, uh, there you go. Keener. I, I actually heard a lot.
describe how a group of them uh, in a lecture class with all the keeners' names on them, and the first one to get all of the <laughs> bingo after the fifth keener wound up participating. That's funny. I mean, no, I mean, everybody wants to be a keener, but then nobody wants to be a keener. So I don't know. Probably everybody in this audience was a keener in high school, but there are people who probably weren't. Okay, next word. Here's another good Canadian word. Scribbler. What is no it? Book. Yeah. What was that? It's a notebook. Yeah, these are the good Canadian. Hillroy exercise books, which for us are scribblers. <laughs> Pretty funny when you think that these common words are actually a little more interesting than you think. So here's uh, the scribbler. And I remember I still have the scribbler, and on the top and the front page was 99%. And here Two is another word that is originally and chiefly Canadian. Here's another one. And I remember. Side road. Really? Surprisingly, side road is used in Ontario, but not in other places or not in other places that we know. I picked up a bunch of kids and I took down the side road and oh, there was a great big snow drift there. Yeah. So I stopped and I said, well, kids, what do you think? Do you think we should go through that or not? And of course, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Mr. You got to go through that. Okay, you guys hang on. So, drove through it. No problem. Wow. <laughs> I picked up a bunch of kids and I went So here again, side road. It's a minor or subsidiary road. Uh, leading off the main through fair, Canadian, a rural mm. road running across a concession, as in North Glengarry. <laughs> like this, you know, those yeah. rural side roads of Ontario. And then, interestingly, uh, in, in, Ontario is a very large expanse and there's lots of roads, many of them dirt roads, and some of them summer roads a road or route used or usable in the summer. Canadian, a route around bodies of water or other terrain, which can be crossed when frozen or snow covered. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So here is the story of a summer road. From Sheminus to Rouen, there was only one overnight stop at Lake Fortune. He also supplied a stagecoach for passenger service from Sheminus to Rouen. This was a five or six hour trip. And if it was very cold, most of the passengers walked part of the way to keep warm. This was a winter operation only, as there was no summer road for even sturdy wagons. So I don't know if you've ever been from Chimines to Rouen, but it's not <laughs> that far. I can't believe it would take five or six hours, but uh, there you go. A different time, a different place. From Chimines so how about this one? A sock. <laughs> Is this the same as a sock up? Ooh, very well be. Right? A wonder. A baby. So you want Boing. yeah, baby, a uh, child, um, complainer. <laughs> um, in the Oxford English Dictionary, it says Canadian slang. And look at the definition. See if you agree. A worthless or contemptible person. <laughs> I don't agree with that. I'm not sure no. I agree with that meaning at all. So I had to take issue with the Oxford English Dictionary lexicologists right. because it doesn't have that meaning for me. So let's hear what uh, Adam says. He came from Southern Ontario and moved up here and he was uh, a very strict uh, disciplinarian. And if he saw you in the hall, he'd poke you in the in the ribs up here with his finger, you know, and uh, no, no, I was a good kid. I, I didn't, I didn't bend the rules too much when I was younger. I was a suck. <laughs> yeah. so, this guy is not contemptible at all. He's just no. a little yeah. suck, right? Yeah. 
So uh, interestingly, uh, you know, the Oxford English Dictionary is going to have to add a new meaning to that word. Now, our, sorry, what was that? I think it was a goody two shoes. Yes, a goody two shoes, Michael. That's exactly right. I mean, I think there's a difference between this person who's a goody two shoes because he sucks up, <laughs> and a person who sucks at something is a person who's yeah. really bad at something. Yeah. 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 So yeah. the contemptible part seems to be the second idea. The, uh, the, the meaning of not very good at something. Yeah, I really suck at that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the interesting thing about that is that there's a, been a lot of a semantic extension in that word. So if you look at suck and you look at all its meanings, the the meaning of being really bad at something and to suck at it is actually a, a development that occurs across the 20th century. So uh, interesting but, word, lots of meanings. But this is a verb when you say to suck or suck up, yes. isn't like a suck. So it could have right. a different meaning, whether it's a noun or a verb. That's right, that's right. You, you can also say that something sucks, meaning that yes. it's uh, something you don't want. That, uh, Exactly. Uh, you don't, it's a job you don't like. If any of you are interested in the word sucks or suck or the word noun, there is a paper on this in the uh, <laughs> journal American Speech <laughs> where Ron Butters has detailed all the different meanings of suck and how it has changed over time. Wow. Okay, I'm going to show you in the last bit of this talk. Uh, I was told not to take too much time so we could have more fun talking to each other. I want to show you some other words that have turned up in the Ontario Dialects Project that you might know. Came from Southern Ireland. Do you know what stumpies are? No. C cigars. Ah, there's a meaning I hadn't thought of. Well, in the uh, area of uh, the country where you get a lot of pulp and paper, uh, there are stumpies a lot of the places, which are the stumps that get left behind uh, once the uh, forest is cleared. And here's one of my favorites, uh, muckety muck. <laughs> it would be good in a children's song. Muckety it's muckety there. muckety muck, muckety muckety muck. Exactly. Isn't this a, uh, an important person? Yeah. Exactly. So here's, a, here's an example. The uh, guy who owned it was an uh, absolutely tyrannical fellow um, who used to throw things at the staff. Really? And, and uh, he's a muckety muck at the CBC right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, when was the last time you heard that word in the wild? <laughs> Email me next time you hear it. <laughs> I'd love to hear that word. Okay, here's another one that's very typical of the North. The uh, guy who. Places. A ring crack. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's Yes, so okay. in that's Canada. A, that's a hockey hockey player. Hockey. Yeah, somebody who's at the hockey games a lot. He never yeah. leaves. Yeah, I know when I was a kid, we that was the only place you could go to hang out. So we were all little rink rats when I was an adolescent. Right. Uh, but here's a happy one to end my talk on, and that is bush party. It's, it's uh, having a... a few bottles of drinkables out in the bush. Exactly, in the trunk mm -hmm. of your car, everybody in pulls up in a clearing yeah. and uh, makes a fire and has a bush party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when I take uh, students on field trips in the north, I always make sure we have time to talk and, and debrief, get together around a fire if we can. Uh, and talk about the amazing things that language has showed us uh, from the North. And it's often the case that on our trip back to Toronto, uh, <laughs> many of the students have appropriated a lot of this new lexicon <laughs> and ways of speaking before they get back to Toronto. Uh, but that's the fun of it, of course. So uh, please feel free to visit my Ontario Dialects website. And I'd like to thank uh, the funding agencies that have provided me with the funding to do all this great work across Ontario. Thank you very much, everyone. And I uh, appreciate your suggestions, input, and attention. And I'll stop sharing now so we can talk more about 
the marvelous variety of English in our own local 